Hi, everybody. It's great to see you here. Entrepreneurs from all over the world. Well, a little bit about us. Global Entrepreneurship Network, GEN, is a year-round platform of programs and initiatives created by communities of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial ecosystems all over the world. Founded by Jonathan Ortmans and the Kaufman Foundation in 2008, GEN is active in close to 200 countries with millions of participants and 40,000 initiatives taking place across the globe annually. Jen Israel, together with EFI, Entrepreneurship Forum of Israel, formerly the MIT Enterprise Forum of Israel, founded in 1994 as part of a worldwide community of the MIT alumni organization, is working in and outside of Israel in offering entrepreneurs ways to improve their chances to succeed. You're welcome to join our acceleration programs, which we are currently running in Europe, Asia, and South America. Today, we will focus on fueling innovation, about business strategies, about funding at times of crisis, and about the important role of women in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in high technology, with speakers from very different backgrounds. Before we move further on, I'm curious to learn where our audience comes from. If you could please answer the poll, we'll share the results with you shortly. It is my pleasure to present Moranier of AWS, whom we chose to moderate today's program. Moranier is a senior startup business development manager for EMEA universities at Amazon Web, Web Services. Her main focus is to offer added value to startups growing at or affiliated with EMEA universities, technology transfer offices, research labs, venture funds, accelerators, and entrepreneurship programs. Moran's experience ranges from being an entrepreneur to leading an accelerator program to teaching entrepreneurship at one of Israel's leading academic institutes. She's passionate about innovation, community, and technology, and connecting them to make a difference. Moran, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ella. I'm excited to be here and excited to have this amazing panel with us here today. Um, thank you, She Entrepreneurs, Effie, the Entrepreneurship Forum Israel, and uh, GN, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, uh, for creating this event uh, year for year. Um, we see different kind of events with uh, such impressive uh, female entrepreneurs and uh, uh, leaders, business leaders, VCs, and others. And with us today, uh, I would like uh, to allow each one of you to present uh, yourself. Uh, we have, uh, um, we'll start with uh, Shelley, and um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Moan, very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you all. I, I am uh, here in the United States, actually in our nation's capital in Washington, DC, uh, very near Georgetown University, just a few blocks away. Um, uh, but originally I'm from Israel, as, as you all, well, maybe perhaps all of you, I shouldn't assume anything, uh, and came to this country when I was five. But I'm Shelley Porges. I'm the uh, co-founder and managing partner of Beyond the Billion. We launched as the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, the first and now largest global consortium of venture funds that have pledged to invest into female founders. And our mission is to fuel women-led innovation. So we're all about the entrepreneurs, but we're also very much all about building out the capital ecosystem that exists for female founders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie. And we'll dive deep a bit more uh, as the session goes on. Uh, Professor Ronit, uh, we would love to hear from you as well. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Ronit Sachifainaro. I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University in Israel at the Faculty of Medicine. I'm heading the lab of uh, cancer research and nanomedicine, and I'm the director of uh, the Cancer Research Center uh, of all uni of the university and 17 affiliated hospitals. As more the entrepreneurial side, uh, I have uh, 
uh, created three spin-offs from the, the work I'm doing in the lab. I'm on the board of directors of uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals, and I'm happy to be here and answer your questions today. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much. I feel uh, privileged to, to be here uh, with you. But before we move on, Laila, we would love to hear about your impressive background as well. Thank you. Um, my name is Lilia Sherman, and I'm very excited to be here with all of you. I am a partner at West Coast Equity Partners, which is a growth and uh, late stage equity firm. Uh, I'm also at Scale Up Unicorn Fund and uh, Falcon Peak Capital. So a bunch of different uh, financial entities investing in all, um, all manner of startups in the technology field. Uh, previously, I was at Golden Seeds, which is one of the largest, actually the largest uh, network of investors in the United States that invest specifically in women-led companies. Um, there's over 300 uh, angel investors, as well as a fund associated with uh, Golden Seeds as well. And um, I am uh, also run an advisory firm called the Sherman Group, which uh, works on strategy and go-to-market strategy with specifically business-to-business -business technology companies. So happy to share uh, any of that experience and insights with all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We also, uh, before uh, we continue, we also opened the chat. So whenever you have questions rising up, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. We won't be able to hear you, but I'll um, look at the chat to raise any questions that our listeners are having. And um, maybe we'll also, um, if when you have the time, we'll love to also hear from you. What's your background? So um, share not only the country uh, in the poll that you mentioned, but also are you an entrepreneur? Uh, what is your background? What is your startup? Maybe you want to share details about your startup. And I'll uh, also um, drop just uh, my my name and my title and my LinkedIn. So you're more than invited to connect. And um, uh, I'm happy that anyone is here who is interested is welcome to add that as well. Um, cool. So thank you very much for presenting yourself. As mentioned, we're very excited to have you here and you can hear in my voice as well that I'm excited myself as well. We look forward to deep dive into this She Entrepreneur session. Um, we have got uh, several uh, questions ready and uh, I'm, I'm very looking forward to hearing your insights. But let's start up with a quick warm up. Uh, three, four questions, quick questions, quick answers. Um, uh, Lilia, let's start with you. Uh, a book, a movie, or a podcast that you can recommend to our listeners? Uh, well, there's two. One, I just went to the uh, actually book launch event for Sticking to My Story by uh, Donna Griffith. It is an amazing book by a really brilliant storyteller. Donna has been, I, I think she's worked with probably over a thousand startups um, and corporations on telling stories to raise um, to raise funds, to sell to customers, to really um, take a very technical message and bring it to something that resonates uh, with people in here. Um, so that's definitely one. Another one I would say is um, The Forever Transaction by uh, Robbie Kelman Baxter. Um, it's all about how to run a business that um, creates renewable revenue and builds uh, really forever relationships with customers. Yeah, and I'll chip in uh, in regards to Donna. I think uh, there's uh, online different sessions that people can view. And also she does uh, webinars and seminars that uh, I highly recommend whenever uh, you see such opportunity to, to try and join one of her sessions. Um, thank you. Uh, Shelly. Any recommendations from you? A yeah, well, I, I think I think the 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 Bible of entrepreneurship is and should be um, the uh, you know er Eric Ries's classic, right? Lean startup. Uh, you know, it is often um, uh, you know assigned. I know in entrepreneurship classes throughout the world, not just in the U.S., not just in Israel, but many other places as well. And so it should be. It's a very small book. It's a lean book in and of itself. Um, and I think that it, uh, for those who have not actually had entrepreneurial, 
entrepreneurial experience themselves really gets you focused in on the essentials. What is the minimum viable product? What are the essentials you need to get started? Because for so many, uh, thinking that it's are you thinking that it's overly complex and overly um, difficult holds them back. And I, I think that Eric does a good job. We, we know him personally, we've collaborated with him on a couple of things and, and he does a good job of helping us understand that you start out you know, with the simplest form of what you do. And, and frankly, that's how we built when we first launched as the Billion Dollar Fund for Women. Some of his principles were what got us going. We thought it would take us 10 years to mobilize over a billion dollars. And in under nine months, we did it. And, uh, you know, I do attribute some of that to, you know, some of the principles that we know from his book. Amazing. Uh, indeed, Ella mentioned before that I uh, uh, ran the entrepreneurship program at uh, Rachman University. And I think this was uh, indeed one of the most recommended and most read books uh, mm -hmm. for early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, Ronit, do you have anything to add as well? Well, I, I have to justify my position at the university and academia. So probably I would choose two of the latest books that I, I read. One is fictional and the other one is a true story is the lessons in chemistry from Bonnie Arms, which is the fictional one. And the other one is the educator of Tara Westpower, which is both of them show the importance of uh, education and how much it helps you in your future as an entrepreneur, as an as everything, as a, as a researcher, an educator, or whatever you do in the future. And I think uh, it's especially the one that the, the true story, the educator is really inspirational for, for everyone that how much persistence, curiosity, uh, creativity can lead to uh, your taking responsibility on your own future. So, can so I just she, jump in here and just add one element of education that, um, you know, I'm sure is embedded in what you're saying here, um, you, you know, uh, but uh, d do not underestimate the power of the people you meet when you're being educated and the networks that you begin building in, in university and po possibly even before them, because that is a huge part, you know, as we as we reflect on education. Of course, we think about the intellectual and technical training that, you know, we all receive. And, you know, I have my two degrees from Cornell that I'm proud of. And we, we continue to work with some of the women, you know, from Cornell University. We're working on a project to get the Cornell University endowment to allocate more to uh, underrepresented, uh, you know, venture funds and, 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 uh, and fund managers. So, you know, that, that network continues on and, and those are critical people. So let's not forget about the people as well. Definitely. And um, may, may, you took a bit of my next question, which is great. So I'll, I'll, I'll also ask Gonit for her opinion with that as well. What is maybe the best or worst advice you received during your career as a researcher, as an education, educator? Um, would love to hear uh, about that. You know, you mentioned creativity, you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of different things there. Well, I probably got uh, two, two great advice, uh, maybe a bit uh, late in my career. Maybe I should write it to my younger self uh, if I could. But the first one is uh, not to listen to background noises and go ahead with your intuition. Uh, many times this will, will lead to whatever fits you personally and, and not to your environment. But the other one is, is a funny story. I don't know if we have enough time to tell you, but uh, when I joined Tel Aviv University, I'll try to make it really short. But when I joined Tel Aviv University after doing my, my PhD in London and then my postdoc in Boston and having, thinking that uh, I know everything I need to know uh, to come back to university and open my own lab, I learned that uh, the part of, uh, of the research and the science is only a very small part from being a leader and, and uh, leading a, a lab today, a 30 scientists and clinicians lab uh, coming from different disciplines. And uh, it was difficult, but then I, I met someone that uh, I needed a, a compound, it doesn't matter what, and he gave me a lot, uh, a lot of connections. And everybody that I connected to him gave me immediately uh, whatever I needed. And then I met him again and I said, how come that everything you, you advised me and anyone you 
uh, you, you connected me with, we're so happy to, to help. And he said, well, for years I've been making my own network and seeing the people I want to work with and not people that I need to work with. And you end up finding that we're not getting paid enough to suffer and work with assholes. <laughs> Sorry to say, it, pardon my French. But then I, I, I learned from this so much and, and the people I collaborate today, I, I find that this makes the whole difference. So you can find many brilliant, in my case, scientists to collaborate with, but they are not necessarily the best people to collaborate. And you can find many not, not less brilliant than those that will be also nice and fun to work with. And this is probably the best advice that I got. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Uh, any of you want to add to that or I'll move on to the next one? Amen. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, so a known phrase is expect the unexpected and run with it. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts, all three of you. Sure. I mean, you know, one of the things I'm known for is is often quoting John Lennon's famous line that life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. Um, it's been my favorite quote since I heard it the first time when I was a teenager and uh, literally, and that's many years ago. So uh, because what it, it taught me, you know, my, you know, my parent, you know, my mother was German. I, I think what she taught me was always have a goal, always have a plan, right? And I think many of us are raised that way, and particularly girls, possibly more than boys, I hate to say it, but I think that that's probably embedded in our socialization. And for those of us who, you know, thankfully have uh, found some success, uh, that has been a critical part of why we became successful. We've had goals, we've been ambitious, and we've pursued them without a doubt. But don't let those goals prevent you from realizing both opportunities and people who may not have factored into your original plans. It's very, very important. Imagine, just reflect on yourself. You know, we talk about talking, you know, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? We, you know, that's, that's a common, you know, thought. Imagine yourself when you were in your, you know, late teens, early 20s, whenever it was you were starting to form your ideas about what you want to do with your career, with your life. Uh, with your business, if you were starting a business already at that age. And, you know, so much of that was guided by what you knew then. But now fast forward, imagine what you knew 10 years later, maybe 20 years later, in my case, 50 years later. Uh, you know, so I'm about to celebrate. I'm happy to say, and I'm proud to represent the next generation, but I am about to celebrate the 20th anniversary of my 50th birthday this summer. And, um, you know, that, that's a lot of because people say to me, how did you get so much done, you know, in your career? I said, well, I've been around a while. <laughs> so that's how you do it. But, but the key here, I think, really is to be open to the experiences, to the, you know, people, and importantly, including people who, you know, you may not have thought that's not my kind of person. O open up a little bit and come to understand what or where or who, you know, what they have to bring to the table and also what you may have to offer them. Because uh, that's also very important, in, in, you know, over time in, in establishing a relationship and, and, and creating opportunities. And I'll just give you one last anecdote. My, after I sold, you know, after my co-founders and I exited my fifth business, so I've had a multi, you know, multifaceted career starting out in the corporate world, uh, ending up as uh, head of marketing, chief marketing and product officer at Bank of America during what became a historic turnaround uh, I was I was recruited as part of the turnaround team, um, then went on to an entrepreneurial career with six companies founded or co-founded. My sixth company was possibly, uh, not to say my smallest, but least anticipated. Uh, and most importantly, one of the things that came out of my career, uh, one of my six companies, was that I met the brother of my co-founder, who now is my husband. <laughs> So it wasn't my highest financial ROI, but it was my best personal ROI, so stay open. That's all I have to say. Yeah, it's a shame that, you know, we can't hear all the clapping or the uh, encouragement from from uh, the listeners, but it's definitely there. And um, thank you. Um, Lilia, yeah, please. Yeah, let me just add. So, you know, as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, we do focus on plans. And when we think about uh, responding to the unexpected, we're usually thinking about crises. Uh, but 
there's a more general, uh, let's say, skill set that we often tend to forget in the rush, which is to stay very present to what's happening now um, for several reasons. Um, a, it will allow you to pick up on the opportunities and the people that Shelly was just speaking about, um, but it also actually literally keeps one more calm to just be where you are and not be thinking five steps ahead, which is what we tend to do as entrepreneurs. So um, there are a lot of, um, let me put it this way. I, I had a friend, I have a friend who did a bunch of research with Stanford University on the skills that are important and they uh, to leadership and to career success. So they went and they interviewed uh, CEOs and, and senior executives and so on. And they gave them a list of skills. And out of the top 10, nine were emotional intelligence skills, understanding yourself, understanding other people, helping other people develop, um, reading uh, you know, the, the mood in the room and what people need and so on. One was about uh, domain expertise. So even though you're very rushed as entrepreneurs to focus on the business and the next deal and, the, and so on, take the time, always set aside time each year, each month to develop the EQ skills that will allow you to respond um, you know, to the unexpected, whether it be positive or negative. Thank you. Um, let's end this part with uh, uh, something more expected, let's say. Um, what excites you? Oh, I mean, I'll jump in again. Um, you know, you know, I, I mentioned at the opening uh, that we at Beyond the Billion, our, our mission is to fuel women-led innovation. And what it takes to fuel women-led innovation is not only to um, engage as we have, um, and we have about 110 partner funds now uh, all, all over the world. So we are truly global. We're on every continent. And, and in our first two years, we've already invested over 638 million into almost 800 female founded companies with uh, 11 of the companies uh, becoming unicorns. And a subset of those 800 companies went on to raise another $4 billion. So that's what we're, we're all about. And, um, you know, in in doing that, um, it, uh, what 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 is uh, what what's clear to us that most of our partner funds that we approached any any fund manager, male, female, you know, whatever their backgrounds, ethnicity, geography was, um, eighty percent of our fund managers today are women, people of color, or both which is very much of an outlier in our industry. Um, I know Lily, I could tell you that because she's in the same industry. Um, it's very unusual. Um, and so it excites me to answer the question. That was a long way of getting to it. But to answer the question, it excites me to see more and more women becoming investors, number one. Number two, then becoming angels, actually investing into female founded or other companies for that matter. And number three, becoming VCs ultimately. So many starting their venture funds once they built a bit of a track record through either through their angel investments or perhaps working for a larger fund and so forth. So that, that's one of the things that excites me because, because what we know from the data is that women are twice as likely as men to write a check for female founders. Uh, of course, we love the men that recognize the opportunity to invest in companies that have outperformed all others, which is female founded companies uh, per dollar invested. They outperform with earlier exits and higher valuations. But that said, uh, just seeing more women get become investors is really exciting. I'll take the, this question as well. So from my perspective, probably the the thing that most excites me is the making an impact on, on cancer patients' lives. So what I found in the last probably 10 years uh, from my independent, uh, because we have a very long career of, of all the degrees and then a postdoc abroad and the whole, uh, until you come and, and you do at that point in time, your own research, you kind of get adjusted and very comfortable in, in your own zone and publishing papers. But at some point, you understand that in order to make a real impact on patients, you have to get out of your comfort zone in the lab and you have to take it and, and spin off a company because nothing directly from the lab will ever get to, to the patients. And, get, and in order to get that, you have to understand how to be an entrepreneur, how to be a founder of a company, how to recruit 
funds and, and, and you need to go through all this manufacturing process until you get to the stage that you can actually do a clinical trial. And in the last month, we started two clinical trials. And this is really the, the most exciting thing I've ever done in my uh, research life. Way more than the money I've been recruiting for the, for the companies. Yeah. Extremely Amazing. impressive. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so I, I'm also on a mission like Shelly to recruit more women to become investors. So, um, uh, but, but not to repeat that, I think there's another, uh, very exciting thing happening right now. I think we're entering a new cycle of very intense innovation. Um, and I hope that, uh, the AI won't, uh, you know, that, that there will be a lot of very unexpected benefits um, in every field. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be. And it's it's sort of the, the dawn of the internet um, that we're in right now. It's a sort of equally exciting time because we can't even predict where uh, we're going to make more discoveries and more innovations and what the world will be like in 10 years. Uh, given all the things that are happening today, I think there's a great convergence of uh, multiple fields, uh, you know, AI, um, healthcare uh, advances, transportation advances, energy advances, um, in many other fields where we're going to see just huge leaps forward. Um, so I'm just excited, um, you know, first of all, to see what happens and to be, uh, to happen have landed in an industry where we get to sort of audition the future, if you will, and, and have some impact as entrepreneurs and investors on which problems get solved. Yeah, I would love to have like a, you know, fast forward capsule 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 and so on to look back and to look fast forward as well and to understand all the changes that are happening. And sometimes it's not even that many years, it could be within two or three years that a dramatic change we'll see. And we're seeing some of it already now. Um, thank you all of you. So now that we got to know you a bit better, we got to uh, warm up, we wanna kick off this session and to dive deep into more of uh, fueling innovation. We'll discuss strategies of innovation. We'll talk about women as founders and lessons learned, as we already um, mentioned, and of course, funding in times of crisis um, and more and more. Um, Ronit, let's start with you on your website. Uh, uh, I started digging in and on your website, I saw that it stated, our vision is uh, that our multidisciplinary approach will revolutionize our perception of tumor progression and consequently, uh, the way we diagnose and treat cancer. Um, can you please share more on your research, on your journey, uh, the reactions that you are receiving, um, and, and how does one tackle such a big and long-term, you know, mission and vision? So, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, I, I will continue with what Lilia just started uh, saying about the convergence. So we're looking at bioconvergence where if I look at my microcosmos in, in my lab, the 30 people that work here or do their degrees in my lab come from very diverse uh, uh, disciplines. They come from medicine, chemistry, biology, engineering, data scientists, and, and even an, an architect. So we need to, to create a language where all of them can speak to each other in every lab meeting and in every research that we do, because we combine all the disciplines in, in everything that we do. And I'll give you one example where now this is one of the clinical trials that I mentioned. Um, what we do is we created a 3D printing platform where we take a piece of a tumor from a surgery room from a certain patient. We create a hundred sort of avatars, a mini me of each tumor. So now we have, we 3D print them according to the MRI of that patient. And we create hundred of those. And then every 10, for example, we can test a different drug or combinations of drugs and flow them to, through blood vessels while flowing not only the drugs that we are testing, but also the blood of that same patient. That means that we have the immune cells, the immune system, 
what we cannot and never had before in any of the systems that we conventionally tested drugs. This led to likelihood of approval of compounds that enter phase one clinical trials to be like 5% in oncology. In the mean for every indication is about 8%, not much better. That means that when you come to test a drug in clinical trials, you know from the beginning that it will take you 10 to 15 years. It will cost $2.6 billion if we take into account all the failures. And you will, 95% that you'll fail. These are really grim numbers. And, and we want to, to improve the attrition rate. And the way we did it is to create models, cancer models that mimic better the clinical scenario so we can predict in a much higher percent what we get in, in our dish to what happens for the patient. So now what we, we started doing, so we created this 3D bioprinted platform where now we started a clinical trial at Shiba Medical Center with 80 patients that will, for each one, we take a piece of the tumor, we test, one of the drugs will be the first line of therapy, the, the choice that he will get, or he or she, and no one can be a control of himself. So they will get only one drug, but we will test in parallel five, six, seven different drugs or combination, a cocktail of drugs. We will know the answer if it worked or not within two weeks, because this works very quickly. But the patient and the physician will know only after six months if it worked or not. And for us to find this correlation, whether if it works in our 3D printed models and if it fits to work in getting a positive result from the clinical trial, that's great. Everybody is happy. The, of course, the patient, the family, the oncologist, and, and we are happy that our platform got validated. But also if we get a negative outcome, meaning that this drug is not working on on this tumor, and this is what we see in the patient after six months, that's really important because it means that we shouldn't treat this patient with this drug. And imagine how much time, money, uh, and mutations, that meaning that they will become resistant to this uh, therapy and other therapies within this uh, six months we are saving. So this is really exciting to, to where we are. And I think it will really, we're trying to change the way we, we predict uh, a response of drugs, but also change the way we, we treat cancer. Yeah, it's a, it's it's almost uh, going back to your fictional book saying like, wait, how <laughs> is it real? Is it happening now? We're not talking 30 years uh, uh, forward. Happening uh, now. Very, very impressive. Um, Shelly, you mentioned before the, uh, in, in the intro and in the previous questions, um, you mentioned um, about the billion dollar uh, beyond the billion fund. And, you know, I would like to highlight this again. Uh, in its first two years, uh, beyond the billion fund partners invested 638 million, right? This is the correct number? Mm -hmm. Correct. Into almost 800 um women founded companies um including 11 unicorns so um it took and and the another impressive uh, statistics about it that it took under nine months only to mobilize the first billion of pledges uh, from your global consortium of uh, vcs were you able to envision such an impact from the get-go what were the major challenges uh, you were facing well, let's just start with um, what I think motivates us all in our different ways, and that is uh, a problem that's bad enough and that you care enough about to want to do something about. I should say that my own entrepreneurial journey earlier in my career was very fortunate. I, I was I had been successful enough as an executive to you know self fund my first company before I sold and I uh, had a business partner that I brought in a couple of years in, and we sold it seven years in and obviously had resources there. And then the subsequent companies I had, I, and I never really reflected a lot on it until I started seeing how other women were having so much challenge in, in raising money. But I had male founders, co-founders, or investors to begin with who came out of my past, either my corporate life or my you know, first company. Um, you know. 
And uh, so I, I, I was really not very sensitive to that. But when I realized, and, and now we're talking about fast forward to 2017, after the 2016 elections, I'd been very involved with Hillary Clinton. I was her senior advisor for global entrepreneurship at the State Department when she was there as Secretary of State. Um, but after the 2016 election, I decided to come back to the private sector and, and address an issue because I thought we would have made a lot of progress by then, and we didn't. We actually had gone backwards. In 2015, women were getting 2.7%. We were down to 2.2% .2 of all venture capital. And even though venture capital as an asset class was growing and, had con and did continue to grow through 2021, a lot of that capital was going to growth stage companies. Well, guess what? If you don't get the funding in your early stages, you never get to the growth stages. That just doesn't happen. And as a result, more and more of the capital was going to more and more or fewer and fewer proportionally women, you know. So uh, so did not uh, actually believe that we could get that done in less than 10 years when my co-founder and I came together to address this issue. I uh, thought it would take us 10 years to mobilize a billion dollars. We launched it at the World Bank meetings in Bali as part of a larger blended finance forum around the UN SDGs. And we were the project partner for number five, gender equality of number five out of 17 sustainable development goals of the UN. Um, and that was an audience that was already prone to want to support different initiatives. Having said that, it was only about two and a half months before that meeting that Sarah and I, my co-founder and I came together. I had the idea before then, a few, uh, about a month or so before then, and I was starting to figure it out. She and I came together in late August, October 11th is the date we launched. I told my friend and, and a very prominent Asian businesswoman who is organizing this particular blend of finance forum that I wanted to launch it as part of you know the larger uh, that, that she was doing and that uh, we would do our best to come with the first hundred million. But of course, we only had two months. So we didn't know if we could do that, but told her not to publicize it because, you know, and hung up with her when she said, yes, please do a come. And Sarah said to me, are you crazy? You told her we're coming with a hundred million in two months. What are you thinking, girl? You know, and I said, well, you know, if we come with 80 million, we, it's 80 million more for women. If we come with 50 million, it's 50 million more for women. We can't go wrong here. Women are getting so little. At that point, women were getting out of one, 1.9 billion, billion out of essentially, a, a, you know, 198 million or almost 200 um, billion dollar, you know, uh, opportunity or, or, or industry. And uh, I, she said, Shelly, what if it's zero? I said, zero? We're not going to do zero. I never think of zero. If you're an entrepreneur, you don't think of zero. I, I hope everyone in the audience can confirm that. <laughs> you know, you start on something. But what I didn't know is that by the time we got to the World Bank meetings, we had over 460 million pledged from our first 43 funds in what is now, as I mentioned, about 110 funds global consortium, as we started reaching out to funds, I mean, the recognition as we presented the data, the recognition that women were, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm listening, you know, um, to Professor Romanit uh, and her amazing work. And I just want to tell you, there are women all over the world innovating, not only in life sciences, cancer and every other thing, but also in so many other fields that we need solutions and not getting funded. Um, that, you know, we were just beyond excited to do that work and to do, to see whatever came. Uh, so we, I used to joke about us as being two girls in a truck. I mean, I'm giving you this example to say, hey, have big dreams and, and believe in it. And, and if it's something you feel passionate about, go for it. Um, and yeah, it's hard, but you know what? Sometimes people step up and realize, hey, here's a real opportunity that we hadn't considered. I'll stop now, and but I'll circle back later to tell you some of the, you know, maybe challenges that we did face, um, and some fun stories around those. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, although you you had the teaser here that saying, you know, all the fun stories, uh, we want to hear that. So I think we'll 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 keep, we'll save time in the Q and A to no matter what to hear that. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Lilia, um, you build, grow, invest in, and advise uh, B2B technology companies from multinational billion dollar giants like VMware, Amazon, Oracle, um, to early and growth stage uh, innovators. Uh, what do you see as critical practices that carry across from young to mature companies? Um, again, uh, uh, Shelley mentioned it before that we see the different stages of the investments and it could be inside a lab and it could be at later stages as well. Would love to hear your thoughts. 
Uh, well, there's there's a few things that I think young companies develop um, that serve them well throughout, and they're important to establish early. Um, so the one that comes to mind is um, just a laser focus on um, not just the needs of the customer, but the needs of the customer in context. Um, it, I think a lot of companies, when they launch, they start with thinking about the product and the technology, and um, it's easy to lose sight of not only the problem you're solving, but what role that problem plays in your customer's life or business. Um, and, you know, you would think that, you know, working with larger companies, they figured it out. Um, but it's, uh, frankly, a little bit of a cycle, you, you know, they'll have some initiative to refocus on the customer, and then they get carried away again by the new product, the new product line, the new, you know, um, so just continually coming back to what problem are we solving and does it really, is this problem yay or big? Is there a bigger problem around it? Um, that's one. Another one is um, company's culture and the leadership's ability to understand not only um, where their own strengths are, but where they need to build and supplement themselves. And that comes from, you know, an individual founder at the very early stages, understanding where they are strong or where they need to build a team. And uh, that actually translates in later stages and in mature companies into, uh, you know, a culture that is open to people contributing outside of their title. Uh, and outside of their, you know, immediate uh, job description and uh, inviting people to, uh, you know, participate in the business, in the growth of the business in every way that they can. Um, so those are the immediate two that come to mind that really have to carry across and start at the very beginning. Um, so you mentioned uh, company culture and, and of course, uh, your, your first tip as well. Uh, it will be interesting to hear from you. What do you pay attention to most closely in your business and entrepreneurial life and what do you decide to ignore? Does it relate to this or is it totally uh, different? So I, I, don't, I don't know if it relates, but when I think about it, the, the thing that I ignore are people who are unnecessarily competitive. And what I look for are opportunities for synergy and uh, collaboration. Um, and, you know, as for young companies, that's obviously critical because it helps them achieve a much bigger scale. Um, it's also critical within larger companies as people think about um, where are their synergies within our business and with our partners and with our customers. Um, so I think that has consistently been a very helpful thing for me and for growing my own companies and uh, helping our portfolio um, sort of become more than the sum of the parts. Thank you. Shelley, would you like to add on that as well? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, challenging our own assumptions about what we can do, what, what, what we're capable of and, you know, kind of, and how other, how we can relate to others, both then, you know, to us in terms of them supporting the work that we do, but also how we can support them. Don't underestimate just because you're an up and comer that you can't be helpful either with your contacts and your knowledge or any other thing that you have to offer. And I wanted to tell a story, it's a fun story. I'm gonna keep uh, the individual nameless. Um, but years ago when I was Secretary Clinton's Senior Advisor for Global Entrepreneurship, and I was doing a lot of work based on President Obama's outreach to Muslim majority countries of the world. So I was doing a lot of work with mainly Muslim majority countries of the world. And I thought, I really wanna do something for and in Israel. Uh, after I'm, I'm working in Egypt and Tunisia and Morocco and Jordan and, you know, name, name the country and also in Southeast Asia and Africa and the Muslim majority countries, we were doing work for, you know, with them and for them. And, uh, and everybody said, well, but Israel startup nation, you know, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> there's nothing to be done for Israel. Uh, we can't teach them anything. And I started looking to the data around the women because I was 
I didn't know for sure, but I had a, an instinct that, you know, like, are the women doing all right as well as the men, you know, because we know how the men are doing. And the answer was simply, you know, look to the Bird Foundation and other good sources of data at that time. Um, and of course, discovered that while well, women, again, were innovating, you know, uh, they weren't getting their fair share of attention. They weren't speaking at conferences at the time at, at the right level. They weren't on panels to, you know, bring to the attention of the world what they were doing. They, and they certainly weren't getting funded at the same level. So all of the above, and I, and I connected with the US Embassy in Israel and we mobilized um, an 18 month panel to address it. And one of the people I invited to be on the panel uh, uh, to this round table, whatever you know, group, uh, and I'm not gonna name names, but he, uh, you would know him, you'd know his name. He was one of Israel's early tech billionaires uh, at that time already uh, doing more investment than uh, in innovation, I think. Um, and I went to him and I said, I'd love for you to join here. I think this is a really important issue in Israel and I hope you, you know, would agree. And, and I shared with him what we came to know. And he said, oh, but you know, Israel, we are, we are very equal. You know, <laughs> we, we treat women equally as to the men. I said, really? I said, well, you know, I noticed that you yourselves have made 71 investments in the last less than 18 months. Um, so how many of those were female founded? And of course there was radio silence, no answer. And I said, I promise you that if you had even one, your investment committee would have come to you and told you, because it would have been so unusual that they wanted to invest in a female founder, that you would remember, you would know this. Um, and he said, no, no, let me check. I don't think that's true. You know, he, he, he declined and you know, he circled back with it. To his credit, he didn't just drop it and ignore me. Came back to me you know, a short while later and said, you're right. And he was like, so surprised. And the next thing, he was speaking down at Ben Gurion University at their innovation conference that they were then. I don't know if they still host that, um, but he spent about a th he was the he was the keynote, and and he spent about a third of his talk talking about how Israel needs to do a better job supporting the female founders. Now that in and of itself is remarkable enough. However, even more so. Fast forward about a year later, I was in New York um, at the invitation of a guy who used to work at the Israeli embassy who was or organizing a lot of investors, US investors. And this gentleman, the tech you know, billionaire investor, uh, Israeli, was in New York with three female founders. He had brought them so that they would look to, you know, uh, helping them you know, raise funds raised fund, funding at this event that generally only guys, you know, were attending because that's, that's the way it was. So, um, you know, the, never underestimate who and where you can make a difference uh, if you do it, you know, in a way that, you know, really connects with people. And um, I think, you know, when I challenged him uh, where he, his assumptions were that they were already investing in women uh, and, you know, he checked out the data, his own data that he didn't know um, you know, good for him. You know, I, I give him full credit for, you know, turning that around. I'm not saying he still invests massively in women, but, you know, listen, as far as we're concerned, our, our philosophy is we're not here to blame and shame. We're here to inspire positive action. And we are confident that when, when, you know, when investors start investing in female founders, they are going to do well because they are getting the creme de la creme of women. Unlike the, you know, somebody asked me, do you think that women are better than men when you say women outperform per dollar invested, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, but think about it. When you're investing in men, it's the normal curve of men by definition. They, the men define the normal curve because they're the majority of investments. You get amazing men like Steve Jobs that are, create life-changing, world-changing innovations. You've got average men who create good companies, which we, you know, may benefit from. And then men, you know, whose companies may close, whatever. When you're investing in women, for the most part, women who get through that VC network are the creme de la creme. It's only the best, or they wouldn't be getting through, I promise you that, which is why. So it's not that women are better than men, but you're basically getting the creme de la creme. Someday, if we have actual equity and we have a normal curve for women like we have for men today, it's probably going to be cl much closer to the same performance, but it's not that now. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. I think it's a good opportunity to also share with everyone um, the first billion, the first billion global impact report. Uh, I added to the chat the link, so uh, whoever is interested in more details can uh, uh, see there. And uh, thank you for that. So we have uh, three more minutes, and then we'll go into uh, question and answers. If anyone has.
questions, feel free to drop them inside the, the chat. Um, and uh, um, maybe like three last questions, we'll do a, a quick rounds uh, on those regards. Uh, what, uh, Ronit, what future innovations would you like to see built? So you're already working on phenomenal technology and innovations and research. What else would you like to see? So obviously, so my passion to techno for technology, like 3D bioprinting, uh, which is one of the things that, that we do here, but I think combining it with uh, another, uh, uh, one of my loves is nanotechnology. So looking at nanomedicines and testing them on such systems, uh, like the COVID vaccine that everybody knows, that's a nanoparticle and, and others that are really way more complicated the molecules than just small molecules, but can do amazing things. And I think that the third technology that I see as the future is looking into the microbiome. We see that it affects, and here I'm, I'm way out of just cancer, just cancer, cancer alone is 300 diseases, but microbiome can affect our well-being in so many shapes and forms and the way we will respond to, to our diet, the way we will respond to drugs, the way we will uh, respond to, to the diseases that we are impacted by. So uh, uh, looking at some of the most amazing uh, uh, last papers, uh, studies that were uh, done on fecal transplants, which is a really disturbing image, but it has been done for people that responded to therapy and now taking it to people, implanting it in, in the gut of people that did not respond to therapy or people that have good genes and uh, in terms of eating everything you want and staying really slim and, and gorgeous and putting it in, in uh, implanting it in the gut of, of people that are less lucky like myself. So it's really amazing to see these studies and how in a way simple it is, but maybe thinking of, ways to change the microbiome and, and using the technologies that are now being created as, as we speak and, and seeing if we can really make these changes by just changing our microbiome rather than getting in many different drugs. Thank you. Um... It, uh, we have three more minutes, so while I uh, add it to in the chat, whoever wants to ask the questions, feel free to do so. Um, can I, uh, uh, Lilia, can I uh, 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 just something a bit easier for uh, before we finish? Uh, what's the funniest, weirdest, craziest thing that you encountered in all those years in the startup ecosystem? Ah. Uh. Well, I'll, so I'll tell you a little story. So when I was um, at Golden Seeds, we, we uh, they still do. We, there are monthly pitch sessions where uh, a set of uh, about seven or eight companies come in and do 15 minute pitches. And it was the summer of, uh, well, let's see, it was must have been six or seven years ago. And it was uh, July. And so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to bring my daughter and her friend, who were both very interested in startups, to, you know, sort of bring your daughter to work day, they can come and watch the pitches. They were very excited. These are two, uh, let's see, 13, I think they were maybe 14 year olds. Um, and so we come. And what I had failed to do was look at the list of companies who were pitching. One of the companies pitching was talking about male fertility. And not only were they talking about male fertility that day, they had some website for, I mean, there was, it was, and the poor, I have to give credit to the founders because it was a man and a woman. And, um, you know, imagine walking into a room and seeing these two kids about to watch this pitch where you would normally use, you know, adult, not offensive, but adult language. Um, so I, it was, it was actually, a, you know, a good, um, a good company and a good concept and all of that, but it, the, the context just made it so completely. Why today? <laughs> why this? Um, so I, that sort of stands out as a very um, extraordinary pitch situation for me. Um, indeed, I think uh, 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 
I would want to ask if your daughter still remembers that event or, you know, <laughs> uh, <Well>. continued. <laughs> I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> I'll ask. Uh, yeah. Um, amazing. So, so we have a, a question from um, the audience. Which of the supporting organizations here can help it? advise female co-founders through the various founding stages uh, from guidance and preparation process and up to negotiation, for example. Maybe I could jump in here and say, we don't do that, but I can point you to a couple of organizations that do. First of all, I think you're uh, aware, I hope you're aware that most of the accelerators and incubators that you, you could join or even just attend some of their programming do that. that. That is a large part of what they do. They not only help you build your companies, but obviously teaching you to fundraise is, is key to that. Um, uh, Amazon itself, for example, I know has numbers of programs as do some of the other tech companies uh, and so forth. Another one, one that's virtual, uh, that I really recommend is Global Invest Her, Global I N B E S T H E R. So if you read it fast, it sounds like Global Invest Her, but it's in Global Invest Her. It's it was founded by a woman named Anne Ravadoni years ago. I'm uh, I'm an advisor to them. I've been since she founded the company. She and I found each other as <laughs> uh, joined soul. She's an Irish woman who lives in Paris. Great woman, very global. Um, and uh, she offers all kinds of resources as well as webinars and training sessions and, and all of that. So I strongly, uh, you know, encourage you to go globalinvesther.com. Um, they, they have some great programming as do other organizations. So they're not the only ones, but those are two approaches I'd suggest. Yeah, and I would like to add, of course, uh, Jen, the, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, and of course, EFI, the Entrepreneurs Forum for Israel, that I see now Ella adding the links. And as mentioned, as Shelley mentioned, also uh, Amazon AWS, the Amazon Web Services, we have a whole platform um, to help um, entrepreneurs in their different stages, um, only both business wise and technology. Um, and again, um, I'm adding here the link you can see there. It's less hand-holding, so it's not that we'll do um, uh, uh, with you uh, review of your deck. With that being said, um, there are different events, there are different sessions or the accelerator program that can do that. Um, so it's worth uh, investing a bit of time and looking at the, that website as well. Um, thank you very much. I would like, uh, first and foremost, to thank all three of you for this amazing, amazing panel and the insights and the, the, the um, I would say, inspiration um, that you share um, uh, globally and not just for female entrepreneurs, but uh, uh, literally with the things that you are, the impact that you're creating and you are bringing and making our world a better place. It sounds a bit cliche, but you know, it, it, it literally is like that. And uh, I would like to invite Ella um, um, to summarize this and uh, a few more thank yous. So thank you very much. Thank you, Moran. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, I want to add a, a spe special thank you to the U.S. Embassy in Israel, who's uh, funding this activity. And I want to relate to some of the things that you just said. Um, and first of all, I think uh, relating to the emotional parts of being an entrepreneur uh, is so important because uh, it, these, these are so often ignored, these aspects. And, uh, and you all re re related to those. I think it's also interesting to look at the inflection points. So uh, uh, Lilia mentioned the internet and how it uh, impacted everything and what's going to happen next uh, with uh, with AI. And at the same time, uh, it need related to, uh, um, to uh, 3D printing, which is an, another definitely innovative uh, technology, which helps us in so many ways. I know about the microbiome which uh, which is a new thing that's uh, that's going to make a, a huge impact. Um, Shelley related to uh, you know believing in oneself and uh, coping with challenges with uh, things that uh, seem to be impossible. And I think uh, in many of you, what you said in many of the things that you said, we heard about the networks and the importance of the networks. And and you know it's not it's not um, you know something that you work on as part of your homework, but this is something that grows naturally around you 
And then you go to people that worked with you, like Shelley mentioned in the past, and you know, in, in school or and and again, and wanting to work with particular people and choosing not to work with others because uh, it's not, not just your grades or your successes, but it's the way you uh, um, you know your interactions with with other people. So uh, having said that, I want to thank you all again and I want to thank our audience and the uh, wonderful questions uh, that Moran prepared for this uh, event. Uh, take care and we look uh, forward to seeing you in future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.